Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this financial wellbeing webinar with our partners, Matteoli Woods. This is the last in the quarter three series of our of our webinars, but don't worry, we'll be back again in November for quarter four. Um, I'd just like to say a couple of thanks before we begin the webinar this evening. First of all, thank you to everybody that registered and uh, is on the webinar live this evening. Your, your attendance is greatly appreciated and I'm sure what is going to be presented this evening will be of, of fantastic interest and of use. And secondly, I'd just like to thank Adrian and Mark from Matty Hollywoods for all of their hard work, their perseverance, their effort that they've put into these webinars so far this year. So thank you very much. And without further ado, I'll pass over to Adrian. No problem. Thanks very much, Steve, and welcome everybody to this evening's webinar. Uh, it's just really good to be back with you again for, as Steve said, the, the third part of the year. Uh, gosh, it, it only seems like yesterday when we started these off in early 2024, uh, and we're already looking at the end of summer and the start of autumn outside. So uh, thank you again for taking the time out. As is usual with these webinars, I do have to start off with the legal bits because we are recording the session. Uh, but I do want to just confirm that all of the information in the webinar this evening is correct at the time of the recording, which is August 2024. And all of the information relates to the 24-25 tax year. As you know, tax information does change from time to time with budgets. And I'm sure our new government have got plans to introduce some radical changes in the near future. If that happens, we will come back and talk to you again should anything change. But this is the world as we know it on this webinar right now. Also incredibly important with this webinar that we are not here to give you any kind of financial advice. Uh, we're not here to sell you any products or services. We do hope though that by talking about our long-term financial planning that we can help to educate you and give you information you didn't know before so that you feel more empowered to go away and sort out your own personal finances. Now earlier in the year I've spoken a lot about this but with each person or with each group that we talk to, we're trying to build a short term, a medium term and a long term financial plan. We've been doing the short medium term stuff earlier in the year. This session and the title that you can see on the screen is 100 percent dedicated towards long term financial planning. It is looking at where we are now in our financial lives and hopefully putting things in place or making plans to put things in place which will serve us in good stead when we need some income later on in life. Before I also carry on, uh, it's not just me uh, talking this evening. Uh, I have uh, one of my colleagues and an expert in property, uh, Rob from White Mortgages. I will introduce him, uh, you to him in a short while. Um, but we are going to be going through two distinct areas of long-term planning, which are pensions uh, and investment in property, be it that a residential property or personal property. Um, I think those two things go hand in hand. So those are the two topics and subjects which will, will raise questions in your mind. So on the right hand side of your screen, you'll see a section with a tab at the top that says Q&A. So if you click on Q&A, there's a text box underneath. And if you type in that text box, that question will go across to my colleague, Mark Redmond, who is there just to answer questions from the webinar this evening. I'll chat to Mark at the end, invite him on, and he can tell us if there've been any popular questions because we're recording the session and we wanna capture those for people who are watching it back after this session has taken place. Can I also just say, when you put in that Q&A section over there, it's very personal to you. So whatever you put in there, no one else on the webinar can see it other than Mark. And Mark will reply back to you personally. So it won't be broadcast to everybody else in the audience. It's just between you and Mark. Which brings me on to the inevitable questions that come in right at the end of the webinar that we don't have a chance to type a reply to. Should that happen, we have your email address and we will use that to respond to you after the webinar. Now, that email address that we took when you enrolled is only used for answering questions here. After the webinar finishes, if we don't need it, we delete it, we get rid of it. We don't use it for marketing purposes and we're not going to contact you about anything other than this particular webinar that we're on at the moment. So you should feel really free to ask questions uh, on the way through. Um, and as I always say, Mark has nothing else to do for the next 45 minutes, so you might as well pop something in there, even if you're just going to say hi to him and give him something to reply back to. So I thought we'd start off by thinking about retirement. 
which I appreciate for a rugby player seems a very, very, very long way away because you have a career at the moment, which is playing professional rugby or being a professional athlete. And then you're going to transition into another career and possibly even transition into a further career before you actually get to your retirement. Now, retirement in the UK as a minimum is 55 years of age soon to be increased to 57 years of age in the year 2028. So, But that age of 55 or 57 does seem a very long way away, but we do need to be aware of it and think about it now. Also, the world of retirement is completely different to how it was 20 years ago. If you rewind the clock back and think about how it used to be, uh, well, if you were working in a big company like mine, like Matty Ollie Woods, for instance, um, you would have had a date when you were retiring. Uh, that was set in sand, in sand and they'd throw a party for you on a Friday. They'd give you a carriage clock or a wristwatch and you'd have absolutely nothing to do on Monday. Now, retirement is very different. We can decide ourselves when we would like to retire, when we would like to transition into another career, when we'd like to end full-time employment completely, having perhaps worked some part-time work leading into our full-time retirement. I think it's really useful to think about it like that because we can now transition into retirement more so than previous generations could do, which I think is positive and keeps social groups around us. If you were to pick up a copy of the Oxford English Dictionary, actually look up the word retirement, you hit with a massive long list of really dour words like retreat and solitude and isolation and obscurity. And I just we hope your retirement's nothing of the sort, that you maintain your social groups around you for longer, uh, you know, that you have connections with groups of people that you manage to maintain for longer. And it's a really good chance for you to think ahead to what you might want to do with your time when you don't have to give it to a full-time job, be that professional athlete or, or in the workplace. And there's loads of people doing lots of things that I, I just wanted to highlight some, you know, really interesting things that some people are doing with their time when they're planning ahead to retirement now. Sit in further education and studying is one of them. I, I've got a friend of mine that recently did a French language degree and, and I said to him, he did retire early and I said to him, why, why did you do that? And he said, well, it's just always interested me. I loved it at school, but I've never had the time to spend on it. So I've gone back and I've studied it and I've I've passed my degree in it. And, and there's, there's all sorts of things like that that you might want to do with your time, even giving back to charities and third sector organizations. But there is definitely one very dangerous one on the list, and that is that you've not thought about it. And the reason is because everybody needs to have a plan as to what they would like to do when they get there. And don't think that you're just going to go on holiday for 20 years of your life at the, at the end of your life. Because if you're anything like me and you go on holiday, after two weeks, you do start to get a bit bored of doing nothing for two weeks. And you're itching to get back home, do some chores and jobs and get back to work and see those groups that you enjoy working with. So having a plan is really, really important. And once we've got a plan, then we need to figure out a way to pay for it. Now, this is kind of transitioning into the two different sections that we've got to this presentation. The first one is pensions. That's what I'm going to cover. That's what I'm used to talking about. I'm, I'm going to cover it briefly um, because I'm taking 45 minutes and condensing it into 20 minutes. And um, my colleague Rob is then going to look at something which is very, very popular in and around the world of rugby and professional athletes, which is mortgages, not just buying your own home, but then progressing on to maybe a second or a third property. I think property is wonderful for rugby players during a transition period away from rugby and into your second career. It allows for income to be coming in to bridge that gap between the two. Very popular topic. So first of all, let's go on with the savings element about why you should you bother saving. Well, quite frankly, if you would do absolutely nothing and expect everybody else to pick up the pieces for you when you get through to later life, uh, well, I'm really sorry, but nobody's going to pick up those pieces for you. Uh, if you look into the state towards looking after you, and um, well, we've had quite a lot of changes in the state pension recently. So we now have something called the single tier flat rate state pension. And I am not going to say that again because it's quite a mouthful. So what could you expect from that? Well, if you've done 35 years worth of work and qualifying national insurance contributions, you're going to get somewhere in the region of £221.20. 
Now, uh, you need to do at least 10 years worth of national insurance contributions to qualify for a state pension. Um, but once you've reached that minimum qualification of 10 years worth of work, you then progress on to the maximum 35 years worth, £221.20. Just very briefly, you're looking at that thinking either that's not a lot or it is a lot. And you both, you know, whichever one of those two you are, you would be right. It's not enough to live a comfortable standard of living in retirement. And for that reason, we need to make arrangements to have savings, pensions and investments that will help us to have income over and above the basic state pension. Those of you who thought, actually, that looks all right to me. Well, you'd be right. It does look all right, actually. It's the equivalent of £11,502 a year. Um, now, that's not much in itself, but most of us, and I appreciate not all of us, but most of us will be living with a partner or a spouse. They may also have done 35 years. They may also be entitled to 11500 quid. So we could be talking about £23,000 worth of household income. Again, not enough to lead a comfortable retirement on, but a very significant amount of money that's not to be sniffed at. So doing nothing isn't really an option. We have to do something. And I don't really care what that something is. It could be one of a whole host of things. Um, but what I do want people to do is actually do something towards it. Now, obviously, I'm going to start with your workplace pension schemes. Those workplace pension schemes are based at the clubs if you play rugby or your ancillary staff or in the workplace if you actually are working for a corporate organization like I do. Everywhere has their own what we call auto enrollment pension scheme. And that is the best place to start because of the tax advantages that you get to pay into pensions. So you get tax relief on all the money that's going in. Not only that, but you get an employer contribution on the top of it as well. There isn't any other account that does that. And you get some tax relief on the way out. 25% of the money would be tax efficient. The other 75, when you take it out from pension, would count towards income tax for income tax purposes. I'll look at that a little bit later on. But you could do anything. You could open an ISA and just all the way through your life save into an ISA. Of course, the money in an ISA isn't tax efficient going in, but it's totally tax efficient on the way out. So it's the opposite of pensions, really, um, because it's from a tax free account, the individual savings account. Um, so you could build up hundreds of thousands of pounds in an ISA and you would have no tax bill living in retirement if that's what you were going to live on. Property is something which is very uh, interesting to a lot of people, especially in rugby circles. And uh, not just your own personal property, but perhaps rental income from property, perhaps a commercial property. Again, that can build towards giving you an income in retirement. Uh, and of course, where you could just do investments, you could just invest money, buy stocks and shares, play the markets, earn a fortune and then retire and buy your own island and aeroplane and everything you've always wanted. But the main thing is to have some kind of a plan as to how what you're going to do when you get there. Now, I've, I've got a, a, a title here of your pension scheme. I'm not going to cover everybody's individual pension schemes because everybody essentially works for different clubs or different organizations within rugby league. But there are some very general points as far as pensions goes to how they work. And firstly, we call the pension schemes that you're a member of something called group personal pensions or GPPs. You don't need to worry about the acronyms and jargon. What I want to underline is the personal aspect of pensions. It is your own personal account. Anything that goes into it from yourself or your employer or club or any uh, additional contributions that you make to pensions is in your account. It's your money. You decide what you want to do with it. The only restriction is that you've got to be over the age of 55. Remember, I said that's changing to age 57 in the year 2028. Once you're over that age, you can do what you want with the money that's in your pension scheme. Typically, there'll be a charge to look after that money because it's invested. So it's given to fund managers who go away and invest that money on global markets and bonds and stocks and shares, try to get that money to grow. And they take a small fee for doing that, which is somewhere between 0.5 and 0.75 percent, depending on your pension scheme. That's the only charge you pay. But if you log on and have a look at your pension, you'll see it taken out of your account on a monthly basis. All it is is something like 
0.5% of the value divided by 12 taken on a monthly basis. I mean, it really is that simple. I want to underline why pensions is the first port of call. And that's because of the tax relief that you enjoy. Now, I don't want to overcomplicate things in any way, but let's say you're earning £50,000. Let's say you pay 4% of your salary, just four, into the pension scheme. You can see here that how that, that's £2,000 a year, but it only costs us £1,600 to put that £2,000 in because we earn tax relief. That's money that would have gone to the inland revenue, but instead of that, it's going into our pension pot instead. And then, of course, we usually have an employer's contribution on the top as well, which is usually matching what you put in. Uh, so if you put 2000 in and your employer puts 2000 in, they'll double it up to 4000 So you can see it's cost you £1,600 to get £4,000 worth of money into a pension. That's a 250% increase. And again, there aren't any other products out there that could give you that, that same uplift on the money that's going into your pension. Please just bear that in mind when you're thinking about being a member of a pension scheme and starting to pay into the future. Now, not all pension schemes are the same, but I've just got an example here of what we've just looked at, which is you pay 4% in and the uh, organization that you're a member of, be that a club or a commercial company, they pay 4% in as well. That money goes across into your plan and it's your money. Now, if you don't do anything, it's going to go into something called a default investment. Again, it does exactly what it says on the tin. Really easy to understand. That is a default that's as useful to as many people as possible who don't want to make investment decisions. And you shouldn't worry about being in the default investment because it's designed for you if you don't want to make investment choices. But I will very quickly just tell you about some of your investment choices in a short while. I um, just uh, wanted to also, while we're talking about pensions, and I'm I'm taking up my first 20 minutes of the presentation, uh, a lot's changed in recent times. And they changed in the previous Conservative budget, and I one would assume that there may be further changes to come with the new Labour government that we have. And they may also want to stamp their own authority on pensions and contributions. But as it stands in this tax year, 24-25, you can pay up to £60,000 worth of your income into a pension scheme. And remember, you get tax relief on that full amount. Now, it was 40,000, it's now 60,000. I don't know what's going to happen in the future, uh, but it's worth bearing in mind that you can now put a little bit more in, more so than you have done previously. Also, we did have something bothersome called the lifetime allowance. And it was a rule that said that if in that individual pot that you have, you went over the value of £1,073,100, so over a million quid, well, you were taxed on the amount that went over and you were taxed at 55%, which is a very high tax rate indeed. Now, I'm pleased to say in this current tax year, that's been alleviated. It's been removed. Um, not many of us get up to a million pounds in pensions, I can tell you. But if you do, you don't need to worry about that you know, terrible tax rate of 55% if you go over the top. And once the money is in your pension pot, you've then got choices as to what to do with it over the course of your working life. Now, as I said, if you're not one for the world of investments, then please don't worry. Option one is the uh, default option, and that is that the company that's looking after your pension money will do it for you. In a default investment, it's designed to be medium risk. So it's not so risky that we're going down the casino with it to blow it all, but it's not so unrisky, if you like, or low risk that we're holding it all in cash and it's not really making much of a return for you. So it will invest in stocks and shares in global markets, but there will be a, a, you know, a medium risk approach to that. Now, if you want to make your own investment choices throughout your lifetime, please do. Uh, there are lots and lots of funds for you to choose from. I would recommend you logging on to your pension scheme provider. And I appreciate some people on here might have played for different clubs in the past. You might have different pension pots with different providers. But nevertheless, please do get on top of them. Log on. If you want to consolidate them together, you can do. Uh, but you don't have to invest all of your money in different investment choices. You can just do a little bit and play around with it yourself. And if it doesn't work, move that little bit back into the main pot, which is invested in the default investment. The choice is entirely yours.
Now, if all of this is completely bamboozling, just talk to us. That's what we're here for. Again, we're not going to give you financial advice, but we can help by explaining the options and the choices that you've got in order that you can make your own decisions about where you want to go to. Um, but if you need us at any point, please don't hesitate to reach out. It'd be a pleasure to help you out. And lastly, with your pension pot, I think it's a good opportunity for you to think about what kind of an investor you would like to be. Because you might not want to invest in oil. You might not want to invest in gas and tobacco production and plastic production. You might want something that's ethically more grounded in its investment approach than having those things in. Although I should say that the profits from those companies are incredibly high. Um, but my own personal investment choices are staying away from things that are not too good for the planet and the longevity of the of the human race. So you might want some kind of a you know a balanced approach to it. And again, there are lots of investment funds, even green funds that you can invest in that still have um, property and fixed income and stocks and shares, but veering away from, from, from those industries that haven't changed their ways yet. Uh, and even if you want an, uh, an investment because of a religious background that you have, again, there are options there for those types of investors as well. But you've just got to log on and go on and have a look at it. It's really easy to do. There's no cost for doing it. There's no cost for moving between um, funds. The only thing is that that some of the other funds that you might want to invest in might have a slightly higher annual management charge. But um, yeah, that's the only thing to bear in mind. Lastly, of course, uh, just before I hand over to our next speaker, uh, I did just want to say that there's been a lot of changes in pensions legislation recently, and it's now based around you and your own personal account. So when we enter, or, so when we think about the world of pensions, I don't want you to bam be bamboozled or worried by it uh, or, or scared of the acronyms and jargon that people use, because all we're doing really is looking at your own personal account. That money is paid into by you and your employer. It's then invested, it grows, and then you can have it back. But how do you get it back? Well, again, this is something that's changed in recent times, but I just want to let you know roughly your choices. So first of all, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, that big red dot is all your money. And as you move through your life, you might want to start to consolidate pensions together, um, eventually maybe working your way towards just having one big pension pot. You don't have to. You can have multiple pension pots if you want to, but that's the general trend of how people deal with it. And then, of course, you've got an element of tax free money in there. So it's 25 percent of that is tax free cash. You can either, again, total freedom as to what you do with this money because it's yours in your account. But you can have 25% of it as a lump sum and then anything else that you take would be taxable. Or you can take down the 25% tax-free cash in dribs and drabs as and when you need it. And then when that's run out, you could then move into taxable income coming out of it. No problem at all. The traditional way, actually, of looking after yourself in retirement is to purchase something called an annuity. That is handing over your pot of money to an insurance company and they're going to try and work out how long you're going to live for based on the law of averages and then they'll pay you a regular income for the rest of your life. Now, I'm not telling you to go away and take up smoking and skydiving to try and get a better annuity rate, but if ever you do decide to buy an annuity, you should talk to a professional in that area because there are hundreds of ways of setting them up. The main thing for you here is to understand that you're buying an income for the rest of your life. So they're going to pay you the same amount of money over and over again, maybe index linked, maybe not, maybe a spousal pension, maybe not. But they're going to pay you that money regularly. And when you pass away, the annuity will pass away with you. Uh, of course, if you don't need the money, don't touch it. Leave it there because so you can defer taking anything out from it. Um, again, you can use it when you do need it. And if you don't need it, you don't have to take it at 55 or 57 soon. You can leave it there for as long as you like. Third option really is to say, well, it's my account and I'll do with that money what I please. And you can do that no problem at all. But if you're drawing down an income from it and you're deciding to have what you want when you want from it, the only risk is that you might run out of money. So it's up to you to manage that, possibly with a bit of help from a financial advisor to try to make sure that that money is going to last you all the way through your retirement. But hey, one year you might want the holiday of a lifetime and draw a bit more down. Another year you might just stay at home and you just want to cover the bills and have a couple of weekends away. So uh, it's entirely up to you. If you want to do that, no problem. And lastly, 
if pensions are not for you, you've had that money stuck in there for all these years and you just want it back, fine. Close the account down, have the money back. No problem whatsoever. The only thing is that only 25% of it will be tax-free cash. The rest of it will be classed as income. So it's going to be income taxed. If you take big lump sums of money out of your pension pot, you are going to push yourself over 20 up to 40, maybe even 45% tax bracket. So that means you're going to pay 45% tax on what you take out from it. So you know, again, just bear in mind that after your tax-free cash, it's a, a taxable income. That's why our compliance team have been all over this slide, writing the word taxable everywhere. They could possibly fit it into a box. So there you go. I hope that's that's kind of cleared that up for you a little bit. Just lastly, uh, one quick thing to mention, which I think is really, really important as far as pension money goes. If you had a bank savings account, you'd sure as heck know what was in it and, and have your right name and your right address on it. And if something should happen to you, you'd make sure that money got to your benefit, you've got to your next of kin or your benefits, the beneficiaries of that money. Uh, again, if you had a stocks and shares ISA, I'm pretty sure you'd regularly check what the balance is and you'd make sure that something happened to that money if something happened to you. With pensions, we just forget about them. But you know, we get an annual statement, we put it in a drawer and we just put it away. Please keep up to date with it. Make sure we've got the right name and address on the account. Make sure we've got some beneficiaries nominated for that money. It could be a significant amount of money that could be in that pension pot as it's invested over the years to come. So you just contact your pension provider. Online, you'll be able to nominate beneficiaries. That would be a wife, a husband, a partner, a spouse, children. You can apply percentages to how much they're going to get. So 50-50 between two people. Whatever you want to do, just keep it up to date. Uh, there is now, I think, up to about £50 billion worth of lost pensions in the UK because people have just not kept in contact with them um, over the last 50, 60, 70 years, and they've just been tipped into a pot. So please keep up to date with it and make sure you keep your details up to date. Other than that, my first section is done, and I've used my 20 minutes up and, and a little bit, sorry. Uh, but that is the world of pensions as it is at the moment. Any questions whatsoever, pop them in the Q&A section. Mark will answer them. Um, but without further ado, I think we should move on to the second section of our presentation this evening, which is looking at other investments and something which is particularly topical to rugby players, which is first, second, third, fourth, fifth properties. And so we thought we'd have a property investment person speak. Uh, and Rob is a member of White Mortgages, which is part of the Matty Hollywood group. So he's an expert in his area. Um, so Rob, if you want to turn your camera and sound on and join me, I'll hand over to you. Good evening. Thank you, Adrian. And uh, good evening to everybody that's, that's on the call. So... <clears throat> um, just wanted to take the opportunity to talk to you, I guess, in the, the wider context of property and that as an, as an investment. And, and really, what does that mean? So I think it's fair to say that the property over time has always uh, proved to be um, a, a pretty safe, um, the pun of safe as houses, as they say, safe investment. And, and as a result, um, people have generally done, uh, taken out property-related investments as a way of funding their income into retirement. Not only in, in, in retirement, but also as well um, in, the, in the current environment where they're looking to generate an income. Now, property's never been more topical than it is now. Um, as you can see from some of the slides, which I'm just going to go through very briefly, um, Interest rates are, are, are almost a, a dec decade high, although we're starting to see the good news come through in the interest rates are starting to reduce. Now, what does that typically mean? That typically means that it invigorates the property market more so. Lower borrowing costs uh, as a result of the interventions that we've seen recently means cheaper borrowing costs. And as a result, you generally see that filter through to the property market. So mortgages. Now, what I just want to cover is the different types of mortgages available, because unless you're in a fortunate position where you're particularly cash rich and they're able to go out and invest in property, you're going to need what you call a mortgage. And that is a means of borrowing to fund the purchase. Now, typically speaking, and it's probably speaking to the audience here, 
you would be thinking of buying a property that you would have to obtain a mortgage for in that you pay that down over a number of years so then when you reach retirement that asset that property and which is broadly as you can see split into either residential property which is typically your home or investment properties which are typically uh, properties that you've bought to to rent out to families tenants commercial tenants be it businesses the idea being that you will pay that mortgage down such as that when you're in retirement the mortgage is paid off the property is owned outright and then the income the rental income typically that that generates will then look to substitute your income into retirement now when people invest in property there generally is a path and that is starting from buying your first home now buying a first home is typically where your big banks and building societies like to focus their efforts every year they like to go out to the markets to say we helped x amount of thousands of first-time buyers onto the property market as a result they tend to incentivize that by cheaper rates and deals but at the same time they also are a bit more should i say generous in what they will do so loan to value which is very crucial in terms of borrowing not in terms of the, not in terms of just the options available to you but what the cost of that borrowing looks like loan to value tends to operate in that as a proportion of the property value that you want to mortgage so typically as a first time buyer you could you could go to a bank or building society and be obtained a mortgage with a five percent deposit that would entail, entail a loan to value of 95 percent so as a result there are many schemes schemes that the government often put in place to ensure that that level of borrowing is achievable in the marketplace now of course once you've bought your first property and be it because as your career progresses your earnings increase you have a family you think about moving home and that is what we would class as a home mover so that would be your main residence selling up and buying another property alternatively having bought your first property you may want to stay there for a few years and that would also entail when different mortgage deals which i've talked to about you i told you about how that works in a minute you'd look to remortgage now that is simply taking a current mortgage and refinancing that onto a new deal with typically a new mortgage lender to either get a better deal or simply because you're coming to the end of a current deal and you need to obtain a new one. Now, in the marketplace, residential property tends to be saturated by the big banks and building societies that you see on the high street, because that is, that is what they do. However, following on from that, typically when you're thinking about retiring, or trying to generate another income, you talk about investment properties. Now, the type of investment property that has been around for a long time is what you call buy to let. So simply purchasing a second property to then let it out. Now, it is no great secret that of recent times, the government has made it harder for landlords to operate. Now, that's not to say that it's still not a, a good place to invest. Because of course, when you're looking to buy a property, you're not looking necessarily to buy for a year or two or three, you're thinking long-term. And of course, not only do you generate an income typically upon, across that time, you also see capital appreciation of values increase as well. So when we talk about buy to let now, and, and of course, probably a good place to a, a, a good place to put this in would be to talk about stamp duty that is because really is the key consideration 
There's a stamp duty, which is a tax that you pay when you purchase any kind of property. Historically, it used to be a flat rate and everybody paid the same. But of course, with government policy, which is wanting and preferring people to own their own home, get on the property market, stamp duty rates are more preferential there, which means that if you're looking to buy a second property or any form of investment property that isn't your main residence, typically you'll find that you'll pay a higher rate of stamp duty. There are other considerations as well, and that is not only the tax that you pay when you buy, say, a property to rent out, but also the taxation that you pay when you generate an income from that. So again, over the last few years, that has changed and it has become tougher, if you like. However, not to say this is to walk away or leave property as an investment, it's just key considerations to have. So buy to let have tend to have been the sort of flavour of the day, if you like, for property investment. But there are other types of property to consider investing in, and there are benefits to doing so. So commercial property. So commercial property, in principle, works exactly the same as, say, a buy to let property, except you're buying a commercial premise, premise to rent out to a business rather than say an individual or family. The, benefit, the key benefits tend to be you get better returns typically, but not only that, is unlike having say tenants that can move in every six to 12 months, you typically find that A, you get tenants for a longer period of time, and B, the I guess the responsibilities of, say, maintenance and insuring property for commercial properties often fall on the tenant rather than you as a landlord. Not only that, but commercial property can be held within pension schemes. So what Mark's, so what Adrian's just talked about in terms of the tax benefits of when income comes into a pension scheme, it's become quite commonplace that you will have your pension pot that will hold a form of commercial property and the rent that comes into that pension is more tax efficient than if, for example, you had a buy to let property, a house, which cannot be held within a pension and benefit from the same tax relief. Not only that, but nowadays you can also borrow within a pension scheme. So effectively your mortgage, sorry, your pension scheme can now have a mortgage. So again, over the years, borrowing mortgages and the types of properties, investments that you can look at have emerged to be more than just a buy to let residential property setup and now you can look at sort of more complex um, more complex borrowing and investments. So whatever kind of mortgage that you look at, be it property or investments. What are the key considerations that we take into account? So income. So for example, if you were looking at a residential mortgage, your own home, a lender would assess that your borrowing capacity around you as an individual, what your earnings are. And of course, they would then take account of what your outgoings are. Whereas if you look at investment properties, be it buy to let or commercial, the key considerations there are understanding what that property would rent or let for, and that would dictate your borrowing capacity. So again, it's not one and the same thing. I always, if you're looking at a commercial property or buy to let property investment, is understanding what kind of income that would generate. Credit rating. Credit rating is a bit of a common myth. We talk about this six-year 
sort of rule that you've got to be squeaky clean, quite the opposite. If lenders took that approach, quite simply, they wouldn't lend any money. So whilst it's always healthy to have a good credit rating, things such as what we would class as adverse credit, which can be anything from missing a credit card payment to being previously bankrupt, lenders do have consideration for that. And there is no hard and fast approach to this six year rule, which tends to be a bit of a myth. And retirement, typically any mortgage or any property investment that you're borrowing against, you would want to see that that has been paid off by the time you retire. One, because of course your earnings are likely to reduce. And secondly, that is the point where you geared up this investment, you've borrowed a mortgage, you've paid it down, and that is where you want to reap the maximum benefit. And then we talk about mortgages as a whole and how lenders assess applications. Gone are the days where we have this computer says no approach to who and what they will lend to. Every lender now tends to have a personable approach. And you know what, if some things don't quite fit the box, and typically we see that within professional sports and um, sports people in that their contracts, they can move around different clubs, Again, lenders very do want to think about the bigger picture as part of their individual assessment of obtaining a mortgage. And which lender? So we, we're what we call a whole of market brokerage. Bit of a mouthful, I know, but what it means is we use any lender that's physically available to us. At any one time, that can be 90 to 100 different lenders. And that's simply to ensure that there's always a lender there to help. Now, whatever type of mortgage you look at, be it residential or investment, the things that we would ask you to consider all tend to be the same. So let's assume you're taking out a mortgage today. Would you want the type of mortgage to be a fixed or variable rate? So fixed being exactly that, you would have a rate of interest that would last for a period of time, typically two to five years, or longer on a commercial investment, and that we would have the peace of mind of knowing your, your repayments would not change. Variable rates are exactly that. They can go up, they can go down. So at the minute, with borrowing rates being quite high and likely to reduce, variable rates have become quite popular. And when I talk about how long you take a deal for, so if you take that deal for, say, two years, after that deal is up, you'll revert to the variable rate. Now, every lender has a variable rate, which typically is higher than the rate that you've just been on. So there's no good reason to go back onto what you call the standard variable rate. So again, it's always ensuring that you're keeping on top of your finances so that you don't see big hikes when a deal finishes and that you look to agree another deal. Now, any mortgage, typically has two fees. So if you were buying a property today, whatever type of property that may be, the first fee you would generally see is what you call a valuation fee. So having a mortgage or taking on a mortgage, you've got the added peace of mind that that mortgage lender would undertake an independent valuation to ensure that that property that you're buying is worth what you're prepared to pay for it and it's readily mortgageable. The second fee, check what you call an arrangement fee. So that's for the borrowing facility, the mortgage itself. Now that can be anything between nothing and several thousand pounds. Again, there are many, many deals out there. At last count, we had access to about 20,000 different mortgage deals. So what we would expect to do is to work through which is the most competitive deal. And how long would you be paying the mortgage back for? Now, mortgage terms can be anything between five and 35 years. And it'd be really for you to decide, based on the repayments, what you're comfortable with. And the types of deal, the, the types of repayment vehicle. So the go-to is what you call a full repayment mortgage. So if you take a mortgage for 35 years, every month, your repayments would have a proportion of interest and then capital. 
and the capital being coming off your mortgage balance. The idea being that after 35 years, your mortgage is fully repaid. Alternatively, interest only. So that's not for the faint-hearted, interest only, because of course you need to accept or put provision in place that when you get to the end of the mortgage term, you've only ever paid the interest, and of course you're going to need to repay the amount that you, you borrowed initially. But you do have the flexibility, and I'll always advocate paying your mortgage off as soon as possible. Now, that can save you thousands of pounds in interest, by making overpayments each month, or alternatively, if you have ad hoc payments that you know that you want to make at odd times, you can also do that as well. So all the types of mortgages that I've spoke about would generally always allow you to have that kind of flexibility, and they're also things that you would want to consider. So not only when you've taken a mortgage out, the job is finished. I would, you would always want to, for example, you wouldn't put your money in a savings account and not continue to monitor the, monitor the rate. It's no different for a mortgage. So again, once you were, you, any mortgage deal expires, you would always want to seek a new rate. At the same time, if you're considering moving home, and also additional borrowing as well. So additional borrowing would be to give you an example would be that you're looking to extend your home and you want to borrow against your home in order to facilitate the build costs. So I hope that gives a broad view as to what the mortgage market looks like. The mortgage market is a very competitive place for lenders and as a result they do heavily fight for your business. So I always advocate that you speak to an independent whole of market broker to ensure that you're getting the full scope of the market available to you and that you'll always be well looked after. So I think I've covered everything there. Um, again, if there's any questions, do feel free to, to put it in the Q&A and we can either answer them shortly or, or certainly after the call. No, perfect. Thank you very much. And a really good introduction to uh, to the topic of uh, kind of mortgages. And again, the whole session is geared towards long term investments and planning for your future. And, and both of the two areas, I hope that we've covered have given you some ideas. I mean, the worst plan to have is to not to have any plan as to how you're going to look after yourself. There's a number of different ways that you can whether it's property, whether it's pensions, whether it's a healthy balance of the two might be worthwhile. Uh, listen, I'm really conscious that while we've been gassing and talking, uh, Mark's been dutifully sitting in the background and uh, answering questions. So uh, I guess before we finish, uh, because we are taking a recording and we want to uh, add as much information on here as possible, have there been any interesting questions to raise up, Mark? I think yeah, I, I think it's best described as a steady evening for me. So so <laughs> apologies, uh, but uh, some interesting questions about you know if you if you make extra payments into pension, do they qualify for tax relief and things like that? And um, I, I think the other thing I would point out is that on on on, on the whole rate you know sort of topic of mortgages and commercial property and stuff like that you really benefit from talking it through with somebody. And um, I'm sure you're going to um, promote your email address there, Aid, just on the basis that if somebody wants a chat about the whole idea of how do I do this, uh, there's help available for us. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, uh, yes, additional contributions to pensions do attract tax relief in just the same way as your normal contributions do. Um, but obviously, there are ways in which we could try to maximise tax efficiency on them. So if there's any questions, don't hesitate to ask us. Uh, and secondly, if there are any questions to do with mortgages, I'm not the expert. That's why I invited Rob on. Uh, but Rob would be happy to uh, answer any questions. And again, I'd echo what Mark's comments that if you're ever interested in setting something up, the starting point is to find out how to do it, what's available and what the steps are to get that through to completion. And again, um, we're, we're not selling you anything or giving you any advice in any way. We're actually here to offer assistance and guidance. So you can ask the questions and we'll try and give you the answers. 
Now, my email address has been on screen for plenty long enough while we've been having a chat here at the end. Um, please don't hesitate to drop me a line if you want to, any questions answered. It's adrian.firth at mattyollywoods.com. We are taking a recording, so you can watch this back through the player portal as well if you need to refine my email address. But other than that, you can just reach out to your uh, welfare officers at the clubs and they'll be more than happy to point you in my direction. And we'll do everything we can to answer the questions as quickly and as honestly as we can do. Other than that, I am so appreciative that you've gave, given up the time that you have during your evening to hear us talk for the last 50 minutes or so. It's been an absolute pleasure to join you. And as Steve mentioned at the beginning, we really look forward to seeing you again uh, at the end of autumn, we'll be, where we'll be looking at our fourth session during the year, our fourth quarter, if you like, near to the end of the season. So... Thank you very much, and I hope you have a great evening. Bye for now.